This video is part of a series called Breastplate Reflections. It is a brief reflection on the answer to the question, What's in a name? So, have you ever spoken to someone who is sincerely wrestling with the knowledge that our Hebrew Messiah of Scripture could not be named Jesus? Well, of course. That person was probably each of us after we first learned that the letter J is only 500 years old. And have you ever thought about how accepting this truth is probably even more difficult when a person is ministered to others and seeing miraculous power exhibited while proclaiming the incorrect name Jesus? Well, this video is for all of those who may have heard, or may have never heard, an explanation of why so many have come to know that our Hebrew Messiah of Scripture had a Hebrew name, and his Hebrew name is found throughout Scripture, although it's been hidden by translation. Also, this video message offers something for those who are fully aware of our Messiah's Hebrew name, Yahusha. It is as well for those who may know someone who has the truth of the matter, but yet has decided, perhaps out of fear, to continue to use the name that is wrong, but yet comfortable. Or for anyone who is simply not sure. And we will talk about those acts of power, the greatest of which is being born again. And how could it be that one could be born again while saying a name that is not the actual name of our Savior? And so I ask that you please watch this video until the end because I believe that this message is sure to offer a blessing to every viewer. No matter how long it's been since you've been involved in Hebrew word studies. And any questions or comments will be addressed um, in the comment section below the video. So, now this is not at all uh, to be an exhaustive study, but rather I'm going to simply share with you what our Father showed me about the matter, and I pray that it will answer some questions that you may have had. Um, in addition, I pray that this message will serve to facilitate your own continued study on the answer to this very important question, what's in a name? So. Let's begin. Acts 2, verse 21. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. End of quote. And um, we can see from this verse the matter of the name of our kinsman redeemer is an important one to understand. For it is the name of the one who redeemed us having purchased us with his own precious blood. And it's important to note that Acts 2, verse 21, is actually quoting Joel 2, 32, or Joel 2, 32. And what do we see here? Well, in Joel 2, 32, the Lord is in all capital letters. And if we look up the meaning of the word using the Strong's number, we will see that the original word here is the personal name of our Creator. The four Hebrew letters called the Tetragrammaton, yod heh wah -He, which is pronounced Yahuwah. And so, going back to Acts 2.21, which again is clearly quoting Joel, or Yoel 2.32, if we look at the Strong's number G2962, 
for the word L-O-R-D, what we find is that the translators took great liberty so as to replace the personal name of the Most High with the Greek word Kyrios, which is a title and not a personal name. So why would someone do that? If you are quoting someone, you say what they say. Also, why translate a manuscript in every place that you see a person, a certain person's name, instead of saying what the original text says? You replace the person's name with a word that is a title. And you know, that's exactly what was done in all of the Law and the Prophets, commonly called the Old Testament. Now, we know that the Messiah is our Lord, our Master, our Redeemer. No doubt about that. However, without ever being fluent in Hebrew, with just the use of a Strong's Concordance, we will see that there has been a concerted effort on the part of translators of the original text to replace or hide the name of our Heavenly Father, Yahuwah, and His Son, our Messiah, Yahusha. So why do I say that? Well, we have to know that if the Bible is the inspired word, of the sovereign creator of heaven and earth, and it most certainly is, then the Most High, who is the author of Scripture, is the one who inspired those he used to record his word, to indeed record his name as part of Scripture. And of course, the recording of the Most High's name, Yahuwah, and his son's name, Yahusha, is not without purpose. And so, why would the translators take such liberties so as to change the translation of what is still there for everyone to see in their original language, should we actually look? Well, I suppose that they were counting on us not looking. Because if we look at the original text, we see that the name Jesus is not found anywhere in the original text. And everywhere that we see capital L-O-R-D, what actually appears in the original text is the yod Wahe, spelling of the personal name of the Most High, which is again pronounced Yahuwah, using the ancient means of pronunciation, without the modern mechanisms of modern Hebrew's vowel pointing. Otherwise, you may see Yahweh or uh, other variations. Now, not to get too much into the linguistics of Hebrew, but modern Hebrew makes use of a vowel pointing system which explains the difference between the Hebrew pronunciations of Yahuwah versus Yahweh or Yahusha versus Yahshua, which is what you will see when making reference to your Strong's con Concordance. And needless to say, the name in the original text is Hebrew and not any combination of English, Greek, or Yiddish. And I've heard some linguists explain that the name Jesus is a combination of Latin and Greek which was translated from the Hebrew. However, personal names do not change from one language to another like words do. Names do not translate. 
So, if your name is James in England, then your name is James when you travel to Japan. It would be at the very least considered cultural elitism for someone to change your name so as to make it to fit their culture. So even by the world standard, that would be called politically incorrect. And that's just an expression of respect for other people. How much more are we to show respect for the name above all names? And that is as best as we know how to. And so it is that in that spirit, let's continue. Now, careful consideration of scripture shows us that how even with this travesty of the hiding and replacing of the Most High's name, our Father has not been denied his plan of salvation for his people. We will come back to this in a moment, but let's look at another scripture. Acts 4, verse 12. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. End of quote. And so, most who would say that they were scripturally born again would say that this happened while sincerely thinking and saying that the name of the Messiah was the name Jesus. Not only that, think of all of the people in the world over the past 1500 years or so who have thought and said the same thing. I'm estimating 1,500 years rather than the full 2,000 years since Messiah walked the earth because it may have taken uh, about 500 years or so to erase the collective memories of mankind on just how the name of our Heavenly Father and our Messiah was actually pronounced. Because we, we must remember that at the time that he walked the earth, no one called him Jesus. Not only because there was no letter J in the English language until 500 years ago, and English as a language is only 1,400 years old, but also because to this day there is no letter J in the Hebrew language or the Greek language, not even to this day. And just like Jesus is a modern-day construct of man, so is the name Jehovah. Jehovah came about through the mixing of Hebrew and Yiddish, which is a German dialect primarily spoken by the Ashkenazi Jewish converts to Talmudic Judaism. So, Let's look again at our verse, Acts 4.12. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. End of quote. Now, when reading this verse, some are of the understanding that this verse means that in order that one may be saved, you must know how to pronounce the name of our Messiah. Well, if that's the case, then the enemy of our souls, Hasatan or Satan, has scored a major victory over all of Yah's people over the last 1,000 plus years. And you know, that is simply not true. So, you may ask, how do I know that? And my answer to you is twofold. Number one, we must understand the word name from a biblically Hebraic perspective. And number two, we must understand the nature of our Heavenly Father as demonstrated to us by our Messiah, Yahusha, who is erroneously called Jesus. So, 
let's start with number two. Let's look at, again at Acts 17, uh, 29 to 30. I'm sorry, this is Acts 17, verses 29 and 30. Acts 17, 29 to 30. Reading. Being then Elohim's offspring, we ought not to think that Elohim is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance Elohim overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. End of quote. So, here we see the nature of our Father is one of mercy toward ignorance. But we also see here that He expects that when we know better, we should do better. In other words, we should not ignore truth, especially when we have partaken of the nature of the Spirit of Truth, having been born from above. And so we see here that while we were yet in ignorance of Yahuwah's righteousness, that he mercifully saved us. And it must be noted here that the word ignorance here is not making reference to a, a lack of academic knowledge. The word ignorance here is not even talking about not being aware of Yahuwah's law or Torah which is his teaching and instruction. But rather, the word ignorance is used here in the sense of lacking intimate heart knowledge of Yahuwah's Torah or law. 1 Timothy 1, verse 13 Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. End of quote. Paul was a Torah scholar. As a Pharisee who sat at the feet of Gamiel, he was required to memorize all of the Torah and prophets, commonly called the Old Testament. The ignorance spoken of here is the ignorance of unbelief which shows a vacancy, an intimate heart relationship with the very word that Paul had academically committed to memory. And then let's look at Matthew seven, twenty one to twenty three. Quoting Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness, or Torahlessness. End of quote. Now, there is much that can be said about this verse, but we, what we see here is another instance of the Hebraic meaning of the words knowledge and ignorance. And it's important that we understand scripture from the perspective of the language and culture used to record it and not impose the language and culture of the world. Here we see the sovereign, all-knowing, all-powerful, omnipresent ruler of heaven and earth saying that he never knew someone. Well, certainly he is not saying that this is someone who somehow escaped the Most High's radar. Of course not. 
Instead, the Most High Yahuwah is speaking of a person who never submitted themselves to an intimate heart relationship with the Living Word so as to receive true knowledge. Paul undoubtedly knew how to pronounce, pronounce the name correctly. And these verses in Matthew, it's our Messiah speaking, and he does not say that this person does not know how to pronounce his name, but rather he is evidently speaking of someone who knew how to pronounce the name correctly, but lacked the intimate heart relationship that Messiah Yahusha suffered and died and resurrected to give to us. In Hebrew, the word knowledge makes reference to intimate relationship, such as the intimate relationship between a man and a woman, as seen in various scripture verses, such as, um, and Abraham knew Sarah. And so, Israel knew about the law and attempted to keep the law in their own strength. But Messiah died and resurrected so that the law could keep us on an intimate heart level rather than a head level of intellectual ascent. Because remember, no one can ascend into heaven so as to bring Messiah down. When we heard our Father's message to us that our Messiah had been offered as the sacrifice for sin for us, it was with humility of heart that we received our Father's provision for our forgiveness of sin and His provision for making us the righteousness of Elohim and Messiah. In that instance, we knew our Father and our Messiah's name, even if we didn't know how to pronounce it, because the name of our Messiah means Yah saves. When we are born again, we are given a spiritual ear to hear and obey the living word of the Most High at a heart level. The spiritual heart being the spirit-soul connection within our physical bodies, which serve as Elohim's temple. In other words, our Prince of Shalom, or our Prince of Peace, and the King of the Kingdom, is then seated on the throne of our hearts, making us complete. Shalom with the promise of a never-ending increase of His peace and kingdom. Isaiah 9-7 This act was not contingent upon us knowing how to pronounce His name correctly. It was instead based on knowing and believing the truth of His character, which is actually the Hebraic meaning of the word name. Now, we're going to come back to this verse in a moment, but I first want to share something with you. Some years ago, I, I first reflected on the undoubtable truth that I was born again, even when I did not know that his name was a Hebrew name. But the Father spoke this explanation to me, he truly treats us as children who progress to various stages of development in our relationship with Him in Messiah. Now, in the natural, a parent will hear the cry of their child and answer that child's need without ever requiring that the child know how to say the parent's name. How much more our Heavenly Father answers the cry of our hearts as His children without requiring that we know how to say or how to pronounce His name. 
Now, the fact that we recognize that our parent is the one upon whom we depend for our needs means that we know something about our parent's name from a Hebraic perspective because it means we know about their character. Which takes us back to number one. Let's take another look at number one. We must understand the word name from a biblically Hebraic perspective. Now this is what the enemy of our souls is really trying to hide by replacing names of people, places, and things in Scripture. So, is it possible to understand some of the basic truths in Scripture even without doing Hebrew word studies? Well, yes, but it is also possible to be subject to the errors of religious tradition without a means by which to see beyond what are sometimes culturally ignorant or biased biblical translations. And it is truly amazing how much the scriptures will open up with Hebrew word studies. So let's take a brief look. The word name is a key an essential word to understand because if we look at the scripture with the mindset of today's western world we would see names as simply nice sounding labels used to identify people which sometimes have cultural overtones however in scripture the name of a person speaks of the character of a person the character being the demonstrated mental, moral, and spiritual quality of a person. And so, unlike today, names in Scripture were truly significant. And that's why a change in name was significant of a change in character. So, for example, Jacob, or Yaakov, whose name was changed to Yasharal commonly called Israel, or the example of Abram, whose name was changed to Abraham. These names, these name changes were not arbitrary, and if we miss that point, we miss the point that scripture is actually conveying to us. Now, a name is also significant of a, a mark or an engraving on the soul. And we can see that when we do our um, Hebrew word studies. When we take a look at those Strong's numbers and we take a look not only at the concordance, but as well at the ancient Hebrew lexicon, as well as studying the ancient Hebrew um, letters. And looking at what the significance is of each letter. And we start to see stories uh, evolve from, from words. So when we take a look here, uh, for example, at H7760, we see listed in Strong's and the ancient Hebrew lexicon uh, that the, the word name is... Um, significant of a mark or memorial of an individual by implication their honor their authority and their character um, the ancient hebrew lexicon goes on to say the breath of a man is their character that's the hebraic way of looking at the word name what makes one what he is. The name of an individual is more than an identifier, but it is descriptive of his character or breadth. Now there's another word here, um, quara or call, and it's H7121. 
And this is a very interesting study uh, on this word, call, because when we think of the word call, we think of actually just simply uh, calling someone, uh, saying their name necessarily, uh, or saying that that's what they're going to be called. Uh, this word call is significant of all of the above, but as well, it's a calling as so as to gather. And we see that H7121 in the ancient Hebrew lexicon. It's the meeting or bringing together of people. It's used, uh, that's significant of the meaning of the word call from a Hebraic perspective. The meeting or bringing together of people or objects by arrangement. Um, so, when we take a look at this, we can take a look at um, the significance of calling upon the name of, uh, which is a phrase we, that is uh, a significant phrase in Scripture, when we call upon the name of. So it's a calling unto, a gathering unto his name, a meeting with his name such as in the Tent of Meeting. And so when we look at the original language of Scripture, we see that what had been cultivated by the Most High was a culture and language that demonstrated the Law and the Prophets. And Yahuwah demonstrated His name with the breath of his character, the Ruach Kadesh, influence, influencing men and women to carry out his will. And so it should not be a surprise that the name above all names is actually a verb. Verbs show action. And so when it is said that the Hebrew understanding of a name is the character of a person, it is saying that the name of a person is that which the person does. It is the essence of the habitual actions that that person does. Their character, their name. The Most High tells us that although his name is seen in all of the prophets' names, the name above all names is Yah saves. And this is demonstrated in the actions that Messiah took in fulfillment of the word. And this is also seen in the Hebrew pronunciation of the name that was prophesied that he would be named a Hebrew name given by his Hebrew mother. Greek may have been the language of commerce at the time, but they spoke Hebrew to one another in the community of Yehuda or Judea. One example is Saul on the road to Damascus, who spoke Hebrew, and scripture specifically tells us that he spoke Hebrew. And then Messiah, as he was dying on the stake, Scripture specifically tells us that he spoke Hebrew. Now, on this slide, we see some um, examples of how we are able to gather uh, more insight as we take a look at the original language as opposed to um, the evolving of language um, that we have at hand today. And we're just going to touch on this on this slide. Uh, it's so much so that um, I think that this is something that you would definitely want to follow up with on your own so as to really be able to gather more from Hebrew word studies. So let's take a look here at Jerusalem. 
uh, in the world today, the name Jerusalem is simply the name of a place. It's the name of a city. And even if you were to just take a quick glance at what, if there was any meaning to the name, which uh, today's culture would not prompt you to do, um, you would see perhaps City of Peace. But there's really so much more there. Um, the actual um, original rendering of the name of the place is Yara Shalem. And that means teaching of peace, teaching of shalom, teaching of wholeness and completion, which is the, the meaning of shalom. Israel, again, is another instance of, in today's world, one would simply say it's, it's the name of a country. Um, and one would not necessarily be prompted to even look up what meaning is there. Um, using the culture of today about names. However, the name Israel in the original text is Yasharal. And it is the Prince of All, Alahim. We see the word Christ um, again. Generally, what's thought of is Christ is making reference to, uh, for some people, it's Jesus' last name. Uh, but it's, for some people, it simply means anointed one. But there's more meaning there uh, to be uncovered. And this is something that uh, I'm looking forward to being able to share uh, on another video. The deeper meaning from the Anointed One. Um, we have here Armageddon. Now this is very interesting. It's really strange when you take a look at how different the spelling is here between what we have at hand today, most easily, in uh, Bible uh, scriptures. However, the Hebrew is Har Madad. Now, I'm going to leave a link in the underneath the video, and I would strongly encourage you to take a look at what is being shared uh, in as much as insight into this word. Um, just in, in, at brief, I will say that Har means mountain, and Moadad me, is making reference to an appointed time, uh, such as uh, the Feast of Yahuwah in uh, Leviticus 23. But again, I'm trying to not make this video too long, and I will place the link below. I strongly encourage you uh, to take a look at the information that's being shared with us there. And then, of course, Jesus. Um, I don't know of any meaning to the, the word Jesus, uh, that it's simply a name, okay? However, when we look at the, the original text, the name of our Messiah is Yahusha, and there is most definite meaning there. It means that Yah saves, Yah being a shortened fo form of Yahuwah, Yah saves. Psalm 68.4, Sing to Elohim. Sing praises to his name. Raise up a highway for him who rides through the deserts by his name Yah, and exult before him. Exodus 15.2, Psalm 118.4, and Isaiah 12.2 all contain the same verse, Yah, 
is my strength and song, and he has become my deliverance. Isaiah 26, 4 Trust in Yahuwah forever, for in Yah, Yahuwah, is a rock of ages. And then we have Isaiah 38, verses, uh, verse 11. I said, I shall not see Yah, Yah, in the land of the living. End of quote. So in these verses we see the name Yah, which is Strong's H3050, which is um, the shortened version of the name Yahuwah, H3068. And we see both versions of the Most High's name in Yasha Yahu or Isaiah 26.4. Now again, when making reference to Strong's, you will see uh, J-A-H or Jah or Jehovah, which we understand shows the modern Hebrew or Yiddish influence on the pronunciation. But nonetheless, the shortened version is what we see time and again in the names of the prophets and in the name of our Messiah, Yahusha. Isaiah, Yasha Yahu, Elijah or Eliyahu, Eliyahu, uh, Jeremiah or Yermayahu, Judah or Yahuda. Yahuwah is Yahusha. Now these are just a few examples of the prevalence of the name Yahuwah in Scripture. And this is by no means meant to be a linguistic study, but rather to show that Scripture reveals to us both how to pronounce and the actual meaning of the name. And when we start to see what is revealed to us in the original text, which is readily available to us, we see both the prevalence of the name Yahuwah and the absolute absence of the name Jesus. Even in the world of business, a translator is entrusted with maintaining the integrity of that which is being communicated. If in the world of business a translator took upon themselves to replace personal names with titles and change names to suit their own purposes, it would be considered a serious matter, and that translator would undoubtedly be dismissed from their position. Genesis 5 verses 5 to 32 is one of many genealogies that we find in scripture and just as an example of some of the depths of richness of our father's word let's look at this literal translation of the names of the order of their birth i'm sorry this is a literal translation of names that are actually placed in order of their birth as they appear in these this genealogy this translation can be found on the ministry website of Chuck Missler. And I, again, will leave a link uh, in the description box below um, because he also has a video uh, that he did um, that goes into greater explanation on this finding, along with um, more ministry links uh, that I will leave below this video, which will provide further insight on this subject. So what we have on this slide is two columns. To the left, the Hebrew names of the lineage of the first Adam, and in the right-hand column we see the literal English translations of these names. When read in order, we can clearly see the master plan of salvation. So let's read it. Man appointed mortal sorrow. The blessed Elohim shall come down teaching. His death 
shall bring the despairing rest or comfort. Hallelujah. This, of course, is no coincidence. This is the sovereign will of our Heavenly Father prophesying of His sovereign plan of salvation, even with names of those He would have recorded in His book. If the Most High would so orchestrate that men would be born and named according to His will and those names be specifically recorded in his book, does it appear that the origin or the original names of the inspired text and their literal translation don't matter to the Most High? No. I think that we can safely say that it definitely matters to him. Which brings us back then to Acts 17, Verses 29 to 30. Let's read this again. Acts 17, verse 29 to 30. Being then Elohim's offspring, we ought not to think that Elohim is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance Elohim overlooked. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent. End of quote. And so while we certainly do acknowledge and are ever so thankful for the depths of the merciful love that our Father has shown us and continues to show us through Messiah, let us take a moment to reflect further on the first part of these two verses. In the first part of these two verses, we see that who is being addressed here is those of us who are born again and can indeed call the Most High Abba, Father. And so as children of Elohim, let us not think that we can make Elohim to be who we think he should be. He is the potter and we are the clay, not the other way around. Now, there is a scripture that immediately comes to mind here. And that's Exodus 32, verse 1 to 4. And it's the story of the golden calf. So let's read about it. Exodus 32, verses 1 to 4. When the people saw that Moses, or Moshe, delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron, and said to him, Up, make us gods, who shall go before us? As for this Moses, or Moshe, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, or Mizraim, we do not know what has come, what has become of him. So Aharon, Aaron, said to them, Take off the rings of gold that are in, in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron, or Aharon, and he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Now, there is much that can be said about this passage of Scripture, but essentially we see what is re referenced in Acts 17, verses 29 to 30. Again, Acts 17 29 to 30 is speaking to those of us who have been delivered by Messiah and as children of the Most High are yet being delivered until we see the fullness of our deliverance. And Acts 17 verses 29 to 30 is warning us that even after being delivered that we not be ensnared by the plots and schemes of the enemy of our souls, Hasatan, or Satan. 
we are warned that as we wait for our Messiah's return from heaven, that we be not deceived into again forming a false image of who Elohim is, not only in safeguarding the truth about how to pronounce his name, but as well in safeguarding our hearts with the truth of who Messiah is. For no lie is without purpose. Even as mankind has been waiting these two thousand years for the return of our Messiah, the enemy of our souls has been at work to do what he does best, and that is to twist the word and replace the true image of our Messiah. For the power in the name of Yahusha is the power of the true character of the Most High being acknowledged, called upon, and exhibited. Of course, we know that Judas Iscariot knew exactly how to pronounce the name, but Judas Iscariot, like those who had been delivered out of Egypt or Mizraim, had formed a false image of who Messiah was, which caused Judas Iscariot to reject the true Messiah, even though he walked and talked and ate with our Messiah, Yahusha. Judas Iscariot had a false image of the Messiah that agreed with the zealots, among whom was Jesus Barzona, Barabbas. Um, you find he actually had the name yeah, Yahusha Barabbas, um, and you'll find just Barabbas in some cases, but when you do the research, you'll see that he actually had both names. That sounds curious, doesn't it? Well, this Barabbas, who the crowd shouted to Pilate to save and execute Messiah instead, the zealot's vain imagination of a Messiah was one who would deliver Yasharal or Israel from Roman rule. And of course, the Israelites had been delivered time after time from foreign rule. But in the fullness of time, our Messiah came to deliver us from that which caused Israel to continuously fall into the captivity of our enemy by giving to us deliverance from the enemy called sin. And that deliverance is made available for whomever would receive it. For whomever will receive it, it is then revealed to be the hidden ones, the Yashara of Alihin. And the Pharisees and Sadducees who were in cahoots with the Romans for the sake of their own positions of power and privilege, were able to agree on the release of Barabbas so as to execute the true Messiah. But even the crafty counsel of wicked men cannot stand against the sovereign will of the Most High, Yahuwah, and our Messiah, Yahusha. Hallelujah. This video was offered in love, not condemnation. It is by no means meant to be an exhaustive consideration of the question. It is meant to encourage the listener to undertake the study of the matter on your own because it's an important study which promises an enriched understanding of Scripture for those with an earnest desire to grow in the truth of Scripture. Hen Ushalom, favor and peace. Indeed, may we be empowered within by the favor of our King unto completion in Messiah. Hallelujah, and so may it be.